In the last part of this course, um, GS240 Data Science or Geoscience, uh, we will be discussing geostatistics. So uh, you may have noticed that there's a progression in the kind of variables that we uh, have been uh, dealing with. Started out with univariate variables, in particular looking at its extremes. Then we went to multivariate uh, and compositional data sets. Uh, then we went to compositional data sets at spatial coverage, it's just maps. And so in this uh, last part, we were looking at sort of the whole picture, looking at multivariate uh, spatial temporal types of problems. So to just give you an illustration in the previous uh, course, uh, years of the course, um, the students wrote uh, a number of papers based on, on projects. And so I'll be introducing those um, and they will give you a good idea of the kind of things that we are looking for in geostatistics. So one application has to do with subsurface uh, heterogeneity mapping and aquifer storage and recovery. And the second will be on, uh, on uh, earthquake engineering and particularly on the modeling of spatially correlated uh, accelerations or ground motion intensity. So here's a hydro, uh, hydrology example. <clears throat> uh, so in this paper, um, the student looked at um, to create essentially uh, groundwater uh, models in order to assess the efficiency of an aquifer and restorage aquifer recharging and recovery process. So this aquifer recharge and recovery process is essentially a process whereby uh, water is recharged uh, actively into the subsurface groundwater in order to then later recover it, uh, for example, for agriculture or, or other purposes. So uh, in order to, this is a somewhat complicated process. Uh, and of course, it's very dependent, this efficiency is very dependent on what's in the subsurface. And so therefore, geophysical data is being used to capture or attempt to capture that heterogeneity. So as I mentioned, the goal is here to produce uh, groundwater models uh, to predict efficiency and in this kind of aquifer storage and recovery process. Uh, such process would work really well in homogeneous media, uh, but in heterogeneous media, there are of course maybe issues uh, that the dispersion of the groundwater may be uh, prohibitive in terms of uh, having a sufficient efficiency of this process. So the way we, uh, they, um, cover this or they investigate this uh, increasingly is using geophysical data and, and particularly electromagnetic data either on the ground um, or in the sky using helicopters flying around uh, with uh, large loops. In addition to that, of course, there's a whole bunch of other information about subsurface, often as interp interpretations from boreholes and regional geological interpretations, what, what sort of the type of formations are available in the subsurface. So you notice that we have a, a large amount of data. Some of the data is interpretation, some of the data is spatial, some of the data is indirect, such as geophysics. And so the question is, can this all be integrated into a groundwater model from which we can uh, deduce somewhat the efficiency of this process and at the same time assess risk by means of uncertainty quantification? So here's a study area, it's in Colorado. Uh, and so the way the aquifer storage and recovery works is that uh, in this particular case, there are actually two, two ways of doing that. Uh, one way is to create uh, basins uh, within uh, which then just water is, um, is drained and the water drains out of these basins into the subsurface. Or the other uh, process is by means of, uh, of active uh, wells uh, pumping into the subsurface. That's probably not the case here. I think uh, these wells are just, uh, this is a, a sort of a, a test site. These wells are monitoring wells um, or wells where tracers are released to study uh, variability in the subsurface. So the lines you see here, the lines, the 2D lines along which uh, geophysical data has been uh, recorded. Uh, so the way this works is that um, is, is by means of uh, essentially um, electrodes that are um, potential and current uh, current electrodes that are put into the into the ground and electrical resistivity or the apparent resistivity is being uh, measured and that would be an indication of the presence of say sand shale or other types of uh, indications of difference in resistivity. So. The geophysical data, is, as you notice, is not uh, 3D. It's a basically a sections of 2D. 
in addition to that, as you notice here, we have wells. So what we notice what we have here is the inverted uh, electrical resistivity. So this is not the heterogeneity, this is the resistivity, but obviously you can see that the resistivity is varying in space, which is an indication that the geological uh, heterogeneity is also varying in space. And so um, geologists uh, may provide some ideas. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, we have a channel type uh, setting. And so uh, this information, uh, in addition to this information, is important in, into building groundwater models. So even if, if you're the, the, even if you're dealing with um, a spatial problem, the, uh, the problem of univariate statistics still holds. So because we have limited amount of information, the question is how much, uh, say, aquifer do we have in this area? So that's a difficult problem by itself in the sense that um, we have limited amount of uh, borehole data from which we could, would be able to calculate that aquifer data. Then we have to account also for geophysical data, but the geophysical data itself is incomplete. So one simple idea would just take the arithmetic mean uh, based on these boreholes. And if you notice here on the right, we see that we have indeed a number of boreholes. But then the second question is, what is the uncertainty on this uh, sand proportion? And so what we can do is use a, a standard statistical approach of, of either calculating that um, uncertainty uh, using the binomial distribution um, uh, but we also have a problem of, of spatial heterogeneity. So uh, we could also use bootstrap, uh, but all these uh, rely on the assumption of independence. So the um, uncertainty on this uh, proportion will be highly dependent on the type of heterogeneity and the type of spatial correlation uh, that is present. And so um, there are all methods uh, to address this kind of uncertainty in the presence of spatial heterogeneity, and one of them is called spatial bootstrap. So once we have that uncertainty, uh, then we have to deal with the second uncertainty, which is the spatial distribution of these channel formations. And so in that case, we again run into the problem of needing to constrain to the observations, which are not necessarily uh, trivial. So the student then developed uh, a workflow that addressed um, all these uh, elements, and we're not gonna go into details of this. Uh, but uh, a couple of words that are um, probably of important is to see that there's the spatial bootstrap part. Uh, then there's the modeling part. So this kind of training image is used to generate uh, groundwater models. They go to uh, mod flow. There's data we call hard data, which is often referred to the well data uh, because they're direct observations. Soft data is often referred to pro uh, essentially geophysical data. Um, then there's other types of methods. Uh, sequential indicator simulation. So all these, many of these methods um, are going to be covered in the next sessions. Okay, let's then turn to the uh, second example, earthquake engineering uh, example. And so this is done by students in the uh, civil and environmental engineering program at Stanford. Um, and so here we're looking at assessing earthquake risk and loss and portfolio loss in and in the in an, uh, essentially in the Bay Area. Uh, which is relevant uh, to us. So here we are, uh, Stanford, San Francisco, uh, the peninsula, San Andreas Fault, and also the Hayward Fault, uh, which is um, an important fault that um, provides a substantial earthquake risk. So what we need to do here essentially is to assess that risk and the amount of loss uh, that would uh, occur uh, under, when we have earthquakes in the future. And so uh, the way um, engineers um, assess that risk is one of the part of that is, is would be to assess uh, ground, ground motion intensity. Uh, so that's basically the amount of shaking that, that we have observed at certain stations and locations. And so that will, of course, that have a direct impact on, um, on the building structures. Uh, and so this all would go into a sort of a big modeling effort on, on evaluating how uh, groundwater motion has an impact on building structures and how collapsing of building structures has, of course, uh, leads to a monetary uh, value or cost 
uh, that's involved. The problem, of course, uh, the problem here is that um, this ground motor motion intensity is also a function of period. So it's, we, what we have here is an entire spectra of ground water motion. And so instead of having one ground, uh, one ground, uh, not ground water motion, ground motion intensity, um, we, we need to model several ground motion intensi intensities uh, as a function uh, of the period. So we now have a problem that is not only spatial, but is highly multivariate. You see in the next couple of slides, there are about 15 to 20 of those periods. So we have to generate models that are not just like in the groundwater case where we have one model of sand shale, we now have to generate uh, many models of ground motion intensity. And then of course, these need to be used to predict uh, losses. So why does this all matter? Um, so here we have an assessment of the impact of the spatial variability of ground motion intensity on loss. So this would be a, a model that calculates this loss. So on the right hand side, uh, we see uh, the mean rate of exceedance versus um, the, the loss in terms of millions of dollars. So here we have the high, the high rates of um, so the, the high probable exceedances, of course, they have a low loss. And then we, have, of course, the low probability ones, and they have a very high lo uh, loss. So this loss is dependent on the ground motion that we have. So since we don't know uh, exactly ground motion uh, that will be occurring in the future, and the best we could do is simulate it based on the information obtained from past earthquakes, uh, we see that we have indeed a substantial uh, uncertainty distribution in, in such loss. So essentially, this uh, kind of geostatistical modeling, um, where we model this correlated uh, ground motion, will have a direct impact on, on loss. So this is, again, sort of similar as the, as the, uh, the groundwater case, where we, we create geostatistical models, and we use those geostatistical models to make predictions of a quantity of interest. And so uh, that quantity of interest uh, will then, uh, we get an uncertainty on the quantity of interest, given uh, the uncertainty on, on the properties that we are simulating. So here we see all these various uh, periods. Uh, so we have ground motion intensity for these various periods. Students did some principal component analysis, but principal component analysis is just multivariate. It's not spatial. So that would ignore the spatial component of the problem. And so, however, the principal component canals can be used to replace the original variables into a limited set of variables dependent on, on the computational variance. And indeed, we noticed that uh, there are a limited amount of principal components in terms of explanation of variance. We could see one, two, three, four, five, and then it also becomes uh, close to zero. So maybe six components would be sufficient to reproduce the entire signal. So the problem we have uh, here is that, uh, unlike the groundwater case, is that we have multiple correlated spatial fields. And so we have to assess uh, that correlation. So one way to assess that correlation would just be calculated in the correlation coefficient. But again, that would be insufficient in the sense that there is more correlation to maps than just the correlation coefficients. And so one way we'll be doing that in the course is by calculating cross variograms or cross correlations. So these would be correlations uh, between two maps, but now not looking at the same location, but looking at different locations. So here we see such two maps. And then once we have that information, which we can obtain from uh, the earthquake data, we can then, once we have that information, then we can generate maps that are correlated uh, of various periods. Uh, and so that would help us in determining the amount of loss. So the general aim uh, here would be uh, three steps that we'll go through in this next section. Uh, first of all, we have to think about how do we quantify spatial temporal variation? Uh, so previously, in, in previous cases, we looked at multivariate distribution, univariate distribution. So what does it now mean for spatial temporal variations? Uh, what are statistical summaries of the data that we obtain uh, that can explain some of this spatial temporal variation? So just like in univariate statistics, one, we have some statistics, maybe uh, such in the univariate case, it will be a mean or a variance or a skewness. Then we can start uh, quantifying and estimating things. Um, for example, once I would know the quanti uh, have the spatial temporal variation quantified, then 
potentially AI could use that to estimate uh, yet unobserved variables. So that's not enough either, uh, because an estimate is just a single number. Uh, the, other, the third thing we would like to do is to quantify uncertainty. So, and that's what will come next, uh, is that we'll talk about the various tools of, of quantifying spatial temporal variation. Uh, we'll look at some of the tools that are available, not all of them, um, but this is already a good set for a first course. Uh, then we, we're looking at estimation, so that will be known as uh, Kriging, and estimation when we have multiple variables, which will co be called as co-Kriging. And so uncertainty quantification would then require stochastic simulation, and that needs to be constrained to data, so we'll call that conditional simulation. So in the next uh, set of uh, lecture videos, I will then talk about these, uh, these various topics.